Hello and welcome to the study in the book of Romans. My name is Mike and I'm very excited and thankful to our Lord that you are here with us to study along with me the book of Romans. If you have been following uh, in the past couple of uh, days, actually I've been sending out to read chapter 1 verses 1 through 17 every single day, Monday through Friday. And every Saturday I'll be releasing a video concerning those texts. Now, in as much as I gave chapters 1, verses 1 to 17, as I was preparing this video, we really do not have the time to cover the whole 17 verses. So for this week, I'll only be covering the first four verses, verses 1 through 4. So let me read it out again, and then we will chop it down and study it together, okay? Verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand to the prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's the introduction to the, to the letter of Paul. And right from the top, Paul says, who is writing the letter? He says, Verse 1, first word, Paul. So he's referring to himself. I am the one writing this. Now, if you have seen the first video, the introduction to the book of Romans, the, the big covering, the umbrella lesson in the book of Romans, we know that Paul is the one who wrote this letter. But as an assignment for you, I would like you to read the book of Acts chapter 9 and see the transition of Paul from being Saul, the persecuted by church, to becoming Paul, the, the apostle of Christ. And so you'll have a better understanding of who the author of this letter is. That's Acts 9. But then after describing who he is as a name, he says and tells them his description. He says, I am a servant of Christ Jesus. Now that word servant in the English language is really doulos in the Greek. The original word is doulos. And this word doulos has two connotations. The first is of the Greek mindset. Remember, the church in Rome is a mixed group, both Jews and Greeks, both slaves and free. So it's a mixture of people. In a typical Greek mindset, when you use the word doulos, I am a doulos, you're talking about, as you can see here, in the, in the, in the Greek mindset, the involuntary permanent service of a slave. In other words, you're a person with no rights. You're a person who's been purchased. That's the typical understanding of a Greek mindset of a doulos, a servant. But Paul elevates it to a new definition because in the Hebrew mindset, when you speak about a servant, here's what it says, a servant who willingly commits himself to serve a master he loves and respects. The key word is willingly. In other words, he is not serving, he is not doing because he was forced to do it, because he was paid to do it. No, he's saying, I am doing this because I love my master, whom I highly regard. That's a doulos. And so Paul is telling his audience, I am that person. I am a doulos, a servant of Christ. Then he goes on and describes furthermore, not only am I a doulos, a servant of God who willingly and love the master I serve, but I am also called to be an apostle. Now, in today's world, when we use the word apostle, a lot of churches, denominations, even use it as a title, apostle so-and-so. But the word apostle simply means sent out. One who is sent out. So Paul is telling People. I am one who is a doulos, a servant, sent out by my master, by my Lord. But in the New Testament, it is commonly referring to the first 12 disciples of Christ, who is also known the apostles of Christ, and later on, Matthias, who took the place of Judas, who after committing suicide, the rest of the apostles cast lots, and called on Matthias to replace Judas. So technically, Matthias is the 13th apostle. Now, on top of that, there is a reason why God, or Christ, Jesus, God, sent them out, 
and to confirm that it is really coming from Christ, the Lord have given them uh, 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 the, the power to do miracles, to confirm their calling, to confirm their apostleship. So as they went around preaching the gospel, they were able to heal the sick, uh, bring sight to the blind, uh, made uh, the lame walk, and other things. So they have a special calling. And they're also given the authority, again, to speak out on behalf of Christ. They are to carry out the message of Christ. And their teachings became the foundation of the church. The church that we know of today, the New Testament, is founded on the pillars of of the, of the apostles. Okay? Paul comes into the picture after the 12. Judas died. Matthias took over. Then Paul had a special calling because Paul was a persecutor of the church. And Christ himself selected him. As I told you, read Acts chapter 9 and you'll see his story. And in Galatians 1, the Lord himself had trained have discipled uh, Paul, as you can see in chapter 1, verse 12 of the book of Galatians, 11 and 12. Here's what Paul said about his apostleship. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man or was taught it by any man. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ himself. And that is what made Paul the added apostle on top of the 12 plus Matthias. Now we have Paul. So, that is the word apostle. So Paul is saying to the church in Rome, he's making sure that the, that the next, before the things that he will be sharing with them, that they'll know exactly who he is and his purpose and where that authority is coming from. That he is a doulos, a servant, a willing servant of Christ because he loves Christ, because he respects Christ, and that he is called an apostle to be sent out to bring that message to the world. The world because obviously it started from Israel and now he's writing to the church in Rome, which is in Italy. So, what is this apostleship? Why am I sent out? I am sending out to preach or to share the gospel of God. Now, the word gospel is a common word. The word gospel simply means good news. And so he's saying, look, I'm here to bring good news. But what is this good news? Because people in Rome, whether you're a Jew or a local, have already heard the word gospel because the word gospel has been incorporated in uh, emperor worship. And so whenever the emperor has some news for the people, for his subjects, a herald, you know, will say, gospel, gospel, the emperor has news. So good news, good news. Uh, it could be anything like, you know, a, a, a son is born or, uh, you know, a daughter is getting married and so on and so forth. It's good news from the emperor. But Paul puts in a new level of meaning to the gospel. And so he uses what is being used in Rome and he says, this is the gospel of God, that is crucial to know that it is not the gospel of the emperor. It is not just a simple gospel. It is not just a simple good news, but a gospel coming from God. It originates from God. And that's what Paul is saying. I am a messenger of this. That this is the reason why I am sent out. The gospel, the good news message that God, this is a good news, listen up, will forgive sins, will deliver from sin's power, and give people eternal hope or eternal life and can be received only by His grace. Alone. Period. Nowhere else. I have so many verses here. It's your assignment to check out scriptures, read them, and that you're able to maximize your learning from this lesson. Okay? Paul was consumed by this very message. God alone can save us. God alone is able to pay the penalty of sin. Okay, that is his message, and he's so consumed with it. In 1 Corinthians, I'll just read the last verse, 23. But read verses 9 to, 19 to 23, and 23 says this. I do all this for the sake of the gospel. 
Paul is saying, you know, I went through all the troubles, but I'm doing all of this for the sake of the gospel. Why? That I may share in his blessing. The, the great stuff, the great things that come along with the people who share the good news. The gospel of God. Verse 2. Which gospel is this? What is the origin of this? Of course, he says it's from God. But then people were questioning, okay, from God, but anyone can say that. So he says, the gospel, God, he promised beforehand. It's nothing I created. It's not something new. It's been here a long time. You might have been blinded. You might have not been aware of it, but it has always been here. What does it mean? Promise beforehand. You see, when Paul was writing this letter, although it was directed to the church in Rome, there were other people who were there who were critics of the Christian faith. And so Paul, especially the Jews who were critics of the Christian faith, just like he was before. So he was saying, look, this message was written beforehand, a long time ago. I did create it. I, I didn't invent it. So it, it will make the, the, the accusers, the antagonists, uh, really know that this message is nothing new. And Paul says further, by the way, that's in Acts 21, that the promise beforehand is really the message of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is filled with promises concerning Christ, concerning the Messiah, concerning the, 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 the good news, the gospel, the salvation of man. And a lot of the New Testament verses, as you can see here, refer to the Old Testament verses that speaks about the coming of the Messiah. And by the way, the Jews until today are still waiting for the coming of the Messiah. For them, they're waiting for the first coming. And for you and I, we're also waiting, but for the second coming. Okay, so promise beforehand. Where? What's the source? Well, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So uh, Paul was saying, look, guys, I did not invent it. I did not create it. It's something I just took from the Old Testament that has been written for a long time ago, which you believe. Of course, he was talking to the Jews and to those who are converted to Christianity, who has the Bible as their source of teaching. He said, it comes from the, new, from the Old Testament. Look at me. When you ever, whenever you see the word the law, the prophets, it all refers to the Old Testament. Because even though you read in the New Testament scriptures, for example, that word scriptures refers to the Old Testament. Why? Because the New Testament was not written yet. Okay, so understand that. It always refers to the Old Testament. It has been written a long time ago, Paul says, beforehand, before I existed. It's already there. The law, which is also called the Pentateuch, which refers to the first five books of the Old Testament, are all written by Moses. And in those books, Scripture also tells us that Moses was referred to as a prophet. So, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Okay? Verse 3. What good news is this? That is coming from the Old Testament, from a long time ago, which I am now sharing with you as an apostle, a, co a, a sent one. What, what message is this? Regarding his son. Now, he was talking about God, his son. Now, what does it mean? See, his son in the prophets, in the law, in the Old Testament, is uh, spoken of very clearly that a new covenant will be established. Now, here are the Old Testament references to the new covenant found in the Old Covenant, which is the Old Testament. Write them down, pause the video right now, and check out those verses. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hebrews, Isaiah, and especially in Isaiah 53, where it actually describes the Messiah and what he is going to go through. Check it out. Okay, Pause the video, write them down, check it, write it on your notes so that you can read them uh, later on. Okay? That's regarding his son, found in the Old Testament beforehand. What? Two things. As to his earthly life. Oh, man, that is very important. There are people who just think that Christ is just God. But Paul is saying, no, he is earthly life. He is a man. 
Look with me, earthly life. Jesus was conceived in a virgin's womb. Who is that vir virgin? Mary, which is a totally different topic, but go check out Luke chapter 1, Isaiah 7. And he was even delivered normally. The word earthly life emphasizes that he is an earthly, actual, historical figure. That he is a man whom you can check out in the, in the history books. As a matter of fact, I've listed down several historians. Many, they are well-known ancient writers, again, totally uh, outside of the Bible, where you'll find that historians such as Tacitus in his uh, Annals, chapter 1544, he speaks about Jesus and what he has done. Uh, in the Jewish historian Josephus, in Antiquities, in chapter 2, verse 18, chapter 3, and Pliny the Younger, in uh, Letters, chapter 10, verse 96, these are regular people. They are just simply historians who wrote about Jesus. So this is external, outside the Bible. And they are referring and giving testimony to the existence of a man called Jesus. So it's very important to know that Jesus is a man. He was born of a mother, of, of Mary. And these historians acknowledge that. So according to his earthly life, what? That he was a descendant of David. Now, in the Jewish mindset, that is super important because they're very familiar with the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament says that the Messiah is coming from the lineage of David. The Old Testament had promised that the Messiah would be coming from the lineage of David. Again, check out the verses. It's good to know. This is not something, this is not a Bible study where you will just be a passive listener. I want you to check scriptures yourself. What does it say about the topic? So again, check out those verses, okay? Pause the video right now, write them down. Okay, next. And it's very interesting to know that both Mary, the physical human mother of Jesus, of whom Jesus came out from her womb, found in Luke chapter 3, and Joseph, the legal father, remember, uh, Mary was pregnant even before Joseph had a relationship with her. Found in Matthew 1, uh, verse 6, 16, Luke chapter 1, were both descendants of David, which fulfilled the prophecies, the, 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 the prophecies of the Old Testament by the prophets in scriptures. The sentence of David, that's the earthly side of Jesus, in verse 4, and who through the spirit of holiness, the spirit of God. Now, it's very important to know that Jesus is the unique uh, son of God, the unique man, because yes, it, he is 100% man, but all at the same time, 100% God. Look at me. In Matthew 1 verse 18, Matthew records about Jesus' birth. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, the human mother, was pledged to be married to Joseph. They're not married yet, but pledged to be married. But, here's the key. Before they came together, a nice way of saying before they had sexual relationship, what? She was found to be pregnant. How? Through the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is, yes, born of a human being, Mary, and so he is 100% man, but all at the same time with no human earthly father because he was born through the Holy Spirit and thus both man and God. And why is that important? Because he is fully man as well as fully God. He alone can serve as man's substitute. He alone can pay the penalty of man because he alone is perfect. That he alone is God, but he alone is man who can represent man. And also in Hebrews it says that he is sympathetic as our high priest. Wow. This is full of message in just the first four verses of the book of Romans in chapter 1. And then more importantly, why do we know that he is uh, God, appointed the Son of God? 
because what? Take a look. Son of God is very important because this title is used nearly 30 times in the gospel alone. Identifies that Jesus Christ as the same in essence as God. In other words, the Son of God simply says He is God. John 1, Hebrews, 2 Samuel, read them all. That's your assignment. This video might be short, but your assignment could be long. Okay? Read them out. Read them out. So, Son of God, while He was eternally the Son of God in anticipation of incarnation, so even though He was not born as a human being yet, he was referred to as the Son of Man in anticipation that a day will come that he will be born of a man. So while he was that, it was when he, in, he entered the world in incarnation, in incarnation, in carne, okay, in flesh, that he was declared to all the world as the Son of God. And as a Son of God, he took on the role of submission to the Father, and so he became our role model. Okay, that's Son of God. Now, the next line says this. How do we know that He is truly God? Because in power by His resurrection from the dead. That's why the resurrection is a key doctrine. That Christ died and was buried and on the third day, what? Rose again from the dead. Resurrected from the dead. Because resurrection clearly declared that Jesus was God, his deity, his God, that he is the expression of God himself in human form. That's why if there's any celebration, Christian celebration that we really need to celebrate, it's Easter, the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of Jesus, because it proves that he is God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ clearly divides him from the rest of humanity, providing irrefutable evidence that he is the Son of God. Romans 10. We will get to that, but for now, just read Romans 10, verse 9. Then he says, In all of these things that I'm telling you, I am a servant, I am an apostle, and I'm bringing this message about Christ, the goodness of God, not of man, not of an emperor, but of God, that he was born of a human being that makes him 100% man, all at the same time conceived by the Holy Spirit that made, get, gave him the title the Son of God because he is God, proven by his resurrection from the dead. Whom am I talking about? Paul concludes in verse 4, last portion, Jesus Christ our Lord. Man! And that word Christ is not a family name. It's that Jesus' first name, Christ. Christ means Messiah. So Jesus, the Messiah whom we serve. Christ, our Lord. So, having said that, 1 to 4 is all we will have for this week. So, I encourage you, if you need to review uh, this video, Go from the start. Maybe there are something that you were not able to pick up properly and or uh, review many of the verses that I've given and check them all out. So brothers and sisters, be faithful in your study. We are just at the very start, at the very tip of the iceberg on the study of Romans. God bless you all and I'll see you next week.